Hallelujah. Well, how many of you read your devotional? Have you gotten the devotional for uh, September yet? Have you been reading it? I was surprised as I read this morning, and uh, I go, man, they must have read my notes before they made that devotional, because everything I wanted to say today is kind of in there. Amen for Sunday. But uh, I want to give you this, just as because we're relaunching today, and people say, well, what is a relaunch? What is this all about? So I just put this down. Why relaunch? Let me just say this, because we believe the best is yet to come. We believe the best is yet to come. And so in the natural, what are we doing? We're changing our service time. We're expanding our ministry. We're building new teams. I'm excited. Starting the, this month, we're going, our life groups are going twice a month instead of once a month. We have twice as many groups as we had before. That's exciting. And so there's a place where our goal is to have enough life groups that everybody who wants to be in a life group, and our goal is that we'd like to see everybody plugged into a life group, but that we have home and places for that to take place. And so we're expanding our team. We're building out our facilities, but in the spirit, we're doing something else. What does it mean to relaunch? Spiritually, we're also having a relaunch. Relaunching a return to the foundation of the Word of God, prayer, and the power of the Holy Spirit. How many know there are some things that are important? And last week, as I shared that message about climbing the ladder and being seated with Christ, sometimes we just have to, you know, relaunch some things or restart some things or refresh some things in our life. Why do I say that? Because we believe that God has more for us than what we have seen and experienced so far. Would you agree? That God just has more for us. So why relaunch? Why do this kind of thing? I believe that God has more souls, more ministry, and more kingdom impact for our church than we have experienced so far. Would you agree this morning? Amen. And so think about it. A relaunch could also be called a refresh. What does that mean? Uh, how many know that you have a refresh button on your computer? And so you're on a website or doing something like it, things aren't working right. You hit refresh, and it's supposed to reboot things and reset things, get it to working back, and get it back to optimum performance, if you would. You also have a restart button on your computer. And their purpose is to increase or produce optimum performance, and it's used in updating your operating system. You know, we do that a lot. How many have a smartphone? How many know your smartphone tells you to update periodically? What it's doing is telling you to relaunch. It's telling you to reflect. It says, don't get stuck using an old system. Amen? And then wonder why it's not working. And so keep, keep everything working optimally. Keep everything performing at its highest level. But what we do many times in our Christian walk, we get our one system of how we're going to do God, and we just do that forever. And then we wonder why things get kind of stale or stagnant or not productive. But I don't know about you. I'm ready to put, push an update button. Amen? I'm ready to update. I'm ready to upload. I'm ready to refresh, restart, reboot, whatever I got to do. So what are we doing? We are relaunching, refreshing, and restarting in what areas? Our faith and our commitment to the word and prayer, our desire to see souls saved and life changed by the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit, our hunger and desire to be used by God for His glory because we believe that the best is yet to come. I'm excited. We have children's ministry over there. Brandon and the team have done an amazing job. They have all the props set up and every week they're adding something new uh, to, to, to the set that's there and, and they got boats and things coming in so they got this whole island scene over there that they're doing so that's going to be expanding every week for our kids because how many know when, when kids come to church they like to come to church mom and dad end up coming more often too Amen. And so we can reach families by caring about children and caring about young families. We can increase our impact in the kingdom. And saying that, I want to encourage you to become a part of that. We only have as much ministry. The church only has as much ministry as what we make possible. It takes people to do ministry. It, it just doesn't happen. I mean, we, we have a small staff, but the staff couldn't do everything that's here. Amen? It takes a lot of stuff behind the scenes to make church happen on a weekly basis, and we all do that and make that happen. But it takes people who want to invest and see God work through their lives. Amen? I put this down. I'm a little bit ahead of myself to get to your outline this morning. But in this area, I found out this, that God cares so much about people and getting to people and ministering to people that he will even work through me. Think about that. God has such a heart for people that he wants to work through our lives. And when we just say yes to God and get involved in ministering to children, get involved in serving in different areas, we're allowing God to move through our life. Think about that. God wants to move through your life to touch people and to make himself known in their life. So I encourage you, pray about signing up. And then after you pray about it, you, you, you could pray like this. Father, should I do it? Let me give you the answer. Yes. 
and just sign up and do it. Amen? And so we do that. And then people say, well, Pastor, why are we pushing life groups so much? Why are we launching new life groups? Because why are they so important to the health of our church? Because they expand the ministry beyond the reach of one man. Life groups expand the ministry beyond the reach of just one man. One person will never be able to get to everyone and will miss people because no one person can minister to everyone. So life groups expand our family, expand the family atmosphere, care for one another. And we so many times find out after the fact somebody's gone through something, somebody's had an operation, somebody's moved to Tucum Carry, wherever that is. But, you know, and so find out what's going on. But in a life group, we're connected on a more intimate basis and we grow together in a more intimate way. Can you say amen? So one person can't do it, but the body can edify itself in love by what every joint supply. And then lastly, on our relaunch tonight, we're launching our first corporate prayer service. We used to meet every Sunday night, but we're taking it up a notch. How many know it's just good to take everything up a notch? So tonight we're going to have the worship team. We're going to be praying. We're going to be prophesying. We're going to be laying hands on people. We're just, our prayer service is just going to be a giant altar call prayer service. Amen. And so we're just going to believe God to move mightily. So I explained it like this. We're going to have our first prayer service. We're going to praise him and we, with one another. We're going to allow the Holy Spirit to lead and direct our time together. No announcements, no offerings, no preliminaries, no preaching. Just a time for pressing into his presence and believing for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's what the first Sunday of every month, because this is our kickoff, we're doing it here, and then October 7th we'll be back for the first Sunday of every month, just to come together as a church, say, hey, let's do this, let's just turn it in, into one service for one hour where we just corporately press into the presence of God and allow the Holy Spirit to move as we pray with one another and for one another, amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, as we move into this, I'm going to say this to you because uh, there's somebody here today that needs to hear these three areas. I believe in both services. I believe God's given me a prophetic word, three prophetic things to declare over you today that people need to hear in our church for where we are. And the first one is this. It's not in your outline. The Lord just gave it to you. But the first one is this. And you can write it down on your back page. There's some areas for notes. And if you're in a life group, this is what we're encouraging you to to do as a life group member that every service pay attention to what's being preached amen, amen. And, and take some notes so that when you go to your life group and, and and you guys begin to talk about the message that was preached that way you go hey this is what God just said to me this is the question I have about the message could you help me with this but somehow you're already engaged and ready to go and you're thinking and and you'll get a whole lot more and retain more by doing that could you say amen so write this down on the back page of your outline. Just write this down. Delay is not denial. Delay is not denial. And that is so important for you to hear this morning. Somebody literally needs to hear that this morning as a prophetic word from the Lord. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, there's a story of Saul and uh, how he didn't like having to wait. He didn't like the delay that he was experiencing waiting on Samuel, so he acted. But I want you to hear something. Even for where we are as a church, you know, eight years ago, we leased the space that's going to become our new sanctuary. Eight years ago. And we drew up the plan. We drew up the preliminary plan, the basic outline of the blueprints that are in the foyer. We drew those up eight years ago. And then as we begin to, to, to uh, move forward and, and, and to investigate that, the fire marshal said, hey, you could do that, that's fine, but you will have to sprinkler this whole building. And I'm going, that sounds like a lot of money. And I'm only renting this place. I don't want to invest that much money into somebody else's building. Amen? So we built half of it, the youth hall. We built what we could do without having to do that. The rest has just been a vacant warehouse, kind of a collect all. Actually, it's a giant garbage can right now. We're going to remedy that. And uh, so uh, we, we want to just eliminate that and clear that out. But it's going to be our new sanctuary. But if we're going to put money into that, and at that time the owner didn't want to sell, all these other things wouldn't happen. We think, oh, man, what are we doing? What a waste renting that and doing that. But no, at the right time, at the right season, God moved. So I want to hear that. Delay is not 
denial. Think about it. So we leased a space. We drew our original plan. We did not advance then because we didn't own the building. But I always knew that delay is not denial. And there's somebody that really needs to hear that today. What happened with Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 13, Samuel had told him what to do and then... Um, He told him to wait until he got there, and Saul couldn't wait. So in verse 9, Saul says, but uh, it says, excuse me, in verse 8, it says, Then Saul waited seven days according to the time by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me, and he offered the burnt offering. Now listen to me. He offered the offering appropriately, everything he did. He was being honest in his own heart, but that wasn't his place to do that. In dealing with it. Now it happened as soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering that Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw the people were scattered from me, that you did not not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, somebody say, then I said. See, that's always the trouble in waiting on God is when you start to talk. Amen. He said, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me in Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. Wow. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord, which he commanded for you. For now the Lord would have established your, for the, for now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. For the Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the hardest thing to do is when you're believing God is to stay in that place that's, that, that, is deni- that, that is delay that can sometimes seem like denial. Are you listening to me? And so you need to hear it again. Delay is not denial in what God is doing in our life. Hear me. In everything in our lives has a season and a timing in God. Learning to walk with God and to wait for His timing to come to pass is essential to seeing the fulfillment of His promise in our life. We cannot force His hand or rush His plan, but we can stand in faith believing to see the promise come to pass. If so, There's that place, sometimes you just have to stand. Well, it seems like it's taking too long. It didn't come about when they were going to say. He didn't show up at the time he would say, just keep standing. Can you say amen? Just stay right there. God's going to do what he said he would do. Now look at your outline with me this morning. So somebody needs to hear that because you've been feeling like there's been a delay in what you've been believing God for, the promise to come to pass, something to come to pass. The Lord said this is a word that somebody needed to hear today, that delay is not denial. Are you with me? Secondly, I want you to hear that it's important to have faith against hope. Romans chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Having faith against hope. Romans chapter 4 and verse 18 says about Abraham who contrary to hope, in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And I really want you to see that all three of these pretty much go together. It's kind of a threefold chord of a prophetic word. Delay is not denial and sometimes it looks like the situation is beyond hope and you just have to stand anyway. Are you listening to me? So important to understand that. So look at your outline. So how do we hold on to our faith when it seems that we are believing against the loss of hope, when everything looks hopeless and impossible and all the odds are stacked against you? How do you hold on to your faith? Listen to what the Message Bible says concerning these verses 7 and 18, 17 and 18 there in Romans. We call Abraham the father, not because he got, to, got God's attention by living like a saint, but because God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. I like that. Isn't that what we read in Scripture? God saying to Abraham, I set you up as a father of many peoples. Abraham was first named father and then became a father. How many know God calls you what you are before you realize it? Amen. And then became a father. Why? Because he dared to trust and believe God would do only what God could do. 
that God would do only what he could do, raise the dead to life, and with a word, make something out of nothing. When everything was hopeless, Abraham believed God anyway, deciding not to live on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but on what God said he would do. And so he was made a father of a multitude of people. God himself said to him, you are going to have a big family, Abraham. And I want you to hear me today. When you have the word of the Lord, it's so important to let the word of the Lord get down on the inside of you. Because once that word gets down on the inside of you, nothing can move you off of it. Doesn't matter what the circumstances are, you won't be able to be moved off of the promise of God coming to pass in your life. Look at here with your outline with me. We will all face times in our lives when we need to believe in God and stand on His Word in the face of impossible odds and hopeless situation. And I'm telling you, the Lord has had me speak this prophetically into your life this morning, having faith against hope. Abraham did just that. He became the father of our faith, and he modeled for us how to believe God. God through an impossible situation. He believed according to what was spoken and not according to what he was able to do in the natural. Amen. Come on, do everything you can in the natural, but then just keep believing God. Just keep declaring the word of God. Are you with me this morning? Keep speaking what God has said. So he believed by faith from his heart and not from his head. See, last week when I climbed that ladder, that's what happened. When I begin to get up in that heavenly place and I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places, I'm living by faith in my heart. When I get back down here in the daily life, I'm viewing everything out of my head. And a natural response, nat nat natural vision, everything. But God wants you to walk by the faith that is in your heart, not just by the knowledge that's in your head. Think about it. He did not believe according to what he could see or feel. He did not believe according to what natural and physical senses told him. He did not believe according to what his head was telling him. He believed according to what God had spoken to him. And I'm actually declaring something to you prophetically for our church today. When I said we're refreshing back and, and relaunching our faith back into the Word of God, it's time for us as believers to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to go back to the Word and just start believing the Word 100%. Amen. Get back just to being, you know, that radical, sold-out believer. Stir that thing up again. That's what Paul said to Timothy. He says, Timothy, that, that gift is in you, but it's just there as an ember. How many have ever gone camping and have embers in your fire out there? And so you throw a little kindling on there, and you start fanning that. Next thing you know, there's a new fire. Amen. So sometimes you got to put some fresh wood on an ember and fan it to a flame. And that's what we do. God, I'm going to put the fresh wood. I'm going to fuel my fire with your word. And I'm going to fan it to a roaring flame in my faith. Listen, we must learn to follow his example and to stand our ground in the face of opposing and contradicting circumstances. When all of our physical and natural feelings and senses are saying, you don't have it, you won't make it, we stand by faith and from our hearts, not our heads, we declare what God has declared in his word to us. And against hope we believe and call those things that are not as though they are. Say this with me, faith always wins. You need to hear that faith always win. And we said last night, the just shall, last week, the just shall live by faith. We walk by what? Faith and not by sight. Praise the Lord. See, we are never without hope in Christ. As long as we are alive in this world, we can expect to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And as I read this morning's devotional, I was looking in there, it said, and, and, and it just was entitled, Turn to God's Word. I said, Yeah. I like that. Amen. But it's talking about discouragement and bad days and everything else going on in this thing about this Alexander. A little this is an awesome children's book. Listen to this. Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. It's a great book for a kid to read. Amen. But sometimes you get around some Christians, they'll be going, yeah, this is my terrible, this is my terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Amen. But in that day, you just need to turn to the Word. Amen. And so they started listing those scriptures, and one of the scriptures was Psalms 27, 13, and, or actually Psalms 107, verse 20. First, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. Psalms 27, 13, that's in your outline. I would have lost heart unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. How many believe to see God's goodness? 
Amen. So think about that. And I put it to you there in two versions. One is in the King James. The other is in the Contemporary English Bible. It says, but I have sure faith that I will experience the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Hope in the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Hope in the the Lord. Praise the Lord. So that's what I'm talking about. How do you have faith against hope? Turn back to the Word of God. Stand on the Word of God. Believe the Word of God. Speak the Word of God. And believe to see it come to pass. Amen? So what do you do? Don't faint. Don't lose heart. Never give up. Keep speaking faith from your heart. Even when everyone around you is saying it's hopeless. Look at poor Job. Here's Job sitting there, calamities coming, and people just telling him. Even got his wife saying, hey, curse God and die. Yeah. And Job, my paraphrase is this. Job just said, I think I'd rather believe God and live. Amen. You know, people say, thank you for that encouragement today. People say, man, you look terrible. I mean, things must be really going rough. I can't believe you're going. Which, uh, thank you for that encouragement. That blesses me. Amen. I was hoping God would send you my way just to push, help me go down a little bit further. Amen. So watch this. Believe, say this with me, believe God always. always. Say it again, believe God always. always. Amen. Faithful is he who called you who will also do it. What a great verse, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 24. Faithful is he that calleth you who will also do it. Amen. I'd sometimes just stand back and say, Father, I, even, I don't understand it. I don't understand the, the delay that feels like denial. I don't understand why this situation looks open. I don't understand it there. But you are the faithful one who has called me. And I'm just declaring today, God, you're going to do it. I'm going to see it come to pass. Could you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. So let me give you the next one right here. The next one is this, it came to pass. So, delay is not denial. We can have faith against hope, a hopeless situation, and then we stand knowing that God's word is going to come to pass. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 7 is a declaration that Elijah was sent to the brook Kedron there, and he's sitting there, and God's feeding him and carrying him. And then, and it says, and it came to pass, the brook dried up. It came to pass that the brook dried up. Or the circumstance and the situation changed. It didn't remain there. He wasn't to camp by that brook forever. That wasn't to be his life source. And so somebody needs to hear this this morning. This is a third level of this that somebody needs to hear. And you've, this may apply to you on all three levels or maybe just one of them. Maybe you've been dealing with denial and delay. Maybe you've been trying to stir yourself up against hope. And maybe you're just handling this area of things transitioning. Very little in life comes to stay forever. Most of life comes to pass. Even though it may abide for what seems to be a very long time it has come and it will pass this applies to the good and the bad in life to people and to things and lastly to our own life how many know this world is not our home we are only passing through I bet we we, we get so attached to things like we're going to be here forever you are not going to be here forever And everything about life is constantly changing and transitioning. So learn to hold on loosely to the temporal things of this world. So what does that mean? That we need to be able to view life and all things through the lens of it came to pass. Amen. Just keep that focus and it keeps you from being discouraged. Because if I don't get that, how do we fight off discouragement? By hearing this word from the Lord this morning. It keeps us from being discouraged when something or even someone does pass. And so many times I want people grieving to think, hey, when somebody passes from our life, begin to thank God for the time that you have with them. Not for the time you're not going to have with them in the future, but look back, God, you blessed my life. I I, I had years. I had a season of them in my life. What a joy. What a blessing. Rejoice in the good. Amen. Not in what I'm not going to have. In fact, uh, this last Monday, we we were uh, with one of our friends uh, that came out of New Life Assembly, uh, Jim and... and, uh, 
Rhonda Killian, and they pastor in Woodland, and great friends of ours. But uh, they got saved at our home church and uh, went into ministry. But then our pastor passed away, and for me, after uh, when after I'd been saved for 33 years, he was my pastor for 33 years. And so ha- having that sounding board to go to, and so now uh, I'm, I'm thankful that through our connection with the Assemblies of God, we have great leadership that I can go to. I have a new sounding board to go to and, and get counsel and help and support in that. And uh, But Jimmy and I look at each other and he goes, yeah, it's been a, he just said it's been a struggle for me on where do I go to get that counsel and that support. So we can go, oh, we don't have pastor now, but I'm thankful for what I have. Man, what I have has saved my bacon over multitudes of situations. Amen? And so I'm thankful that for that season that was in my life and not just carrying a heaviness that he's no longer in my life. Amen? So think about it. The world declared that this very world we, the, the word of God declares that this very world we live in has come to pass. So this puts our focus on looking forward to what is to come and the hope that is to come with it. Look at this. 2 Peter chapter 3. I put it there in your, in your outline from the Amplified. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Somebody say the day of the Lord. Amen. And let me help you many times when it comes to Bible prophecy and other things. There's there's an interesting phrase in Scripture that says, in that day. In that day. And when you read Scripture and you read that verse, you need to ask yourself. When people say, well, that doesn't mean this, this doesn't mean that. But the Word of God is saying that there will be a day when those things will transpire. So if you can't point to that day and those things transpiring, then that day is yet to come. Are you with me? And so a lot of people interpret Scripture, and what they've done is they've nullified a lot of in that day. And I said, the only problem I have with your interpretation is that that day hasn't come. Amen. And so, but it says here that there's coming a day, the day of the Lord will come as a thief, and then the heavens will vanish, pass away with a thunderous crash, and the material elements of the universe will be dissolved with fire. How many know you don't want to be hanging around here when that's going on? All right, amen. And the earth and the works that are upon it will be burnt up. Since all these things are in the process of being dissolved, what kind of person ought each of you be in the meanwhile in consecrated and holy behavior and devout and godly qualities? Amen. So think, wait a minute, what am I living for? I'm living for there, not for here. I'm living for eternity. This world is not my home. I have eternal focus. So I, I'm able to have a close grip. I, I don't get that grieved over everything or carry that much because this is not the end of anything. Are you with me this morning? This is not the end of anything. Praise the Lord. See, there's the promise of the new that follows, it came to pass. Hebrews 12 tells us that Jesus knew that his life and the cross he had to endure had come to pass. He had his eyes fixed on the joy that was before him. Keep your eyes on the joy that is before you. Everything else has come to pass. Amen. Everything in life. Don't get so caught up on this or on that. We get so serious about everything. People don't know how to take me all the time because I really think everything's funny. I really do. I think people are just way too serious about stuff. We're just overly... Yeah, there, there, there are some stuff that we should be strong about, have an opinion about, but in the scope of eternity, give me a major break. Amen. Amen. Really? Oh, so if the Lord showed up, if the rapture was right now, you're before the presence of the Lord. You're really going to be concerned about that. You're really going to walk up to you. No, i got a real issue with all this stuff. I don't think so. But we're so intense about so many things. You know, I posted a thing the other day because I, I, I just laugh at stupidity. There's just a lot of stupid logic running around in our society today. I, just, I look at that stuff. And I, I look at pe- pe- people that are defending. That I made a post on people. Uh, uh, and, and it's true. There, 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 there's gun violence and, and, and innocent death is lost and everything else. But compared to abortion... In, in, in mass shootings, there's been less than 1,500 people who have lost their lives since 1966 in mass shootings. In mass shootings. Less than 1,500 people. And not all of those have been with AR-15s or automatic, semi-automatic rifles. Many of them have been with all, all different kinds of, of, of weapons in that. But in all mass shootings in that, less than 1,500. 
But yet, when it comes to abortion, the same people that will lobby for gun control and strict gun control and abolish all these firearms will stand up and support aborting babies in the womb, calling it a safe evacuation. If I said, we're going to have a safe evacuation out of this building, but you're going to die in the process, that would kind of not make sense, right? Are you with me? And so, but the, the, so they were talking about abortion, that the safest way to evacuate a baby out of a womb. When I think about evacuating somebody safely, I'm thinking about their life being spared. But we've had less than 1,500 people who have lost their life innocently through gun violence and mass shooting. But we as a nation have murdered over 1.3 million babies a year through abortion. That's stupid logic. That you would want to abolish one and defend the other. Could you say amen? And that's a cause. And I'll speak to that. I'm not ashamed to speak to that. I'm not afraid to speak to that or do all that. But you know what? In the weight of eternity, how many know God's going to take care of all that? Amen. And so you don't have to be ugly and adamant and doing all those other things. Move right along. I don't know why I said that, but that's probably a word for somebody too. Hallelujah. Amen. So what do we do? Look at it here, the message of your Bible. It's Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 in your, in your outline there. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans are cheering us on. What it means, we'd better get on with it. Strip down, start running, never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Isn't that good? Amen. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race that we are in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was heading. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. Come on. We can put. Come on, it came to pass. It's going to pass. You can put up with it. It's not forever. You're going to make it to the other side. Could I get an amen this morning? You are going to make it. See, look at that. Look at what Jesus endured. Cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor. Right alongside God. When you find yourself Flogging, flagging in your faith. Go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through that will shoot adrenaline into your soul. Amen. God, I know I'm in a season, but remember, this is going to pass. And I go back and I look at the Lord Jesus Christ and everything. Uh, uh, Brad Allen, our superintendent, and I, I may use it a little bit next time we have communion, but it was so powerful. And he goes, you know what? Jesus, on, on the last night of, of, uh, of supper with his disciples, in John 13 it began, and, and it was a, a good night that turned into a very bad night. Amen. And so he starts out, he's having dinner with people, and the people that are being honored to have dinner with him and even dip in, in the cup with him and partake with him, there's a person there that's been given this honor that's about to betray him. Amen. And, and, and people are about to abandon him. He's about to be despised, rejected, turned over, everything going terrible. And yet through all of that, what happened? When he gets to the cross, what's he doing? While they're nailing his hands to the cross, while nails are being driven in his flesh, he's praying a prayer of forgiveness. While he's hanging there on the cross, he's securing another man's eternity. And just before he dies, on the cross, he's making sure his mother is taken care of. So in the middle of the worst day you could ever imagine, how was he able to deal with some, be concerned about our forgiveness, about somebody else's eternity, and about the welfare of his mother, because he knew this too shall pass. Amen? And this is leading on to a far greater glory. See, in some, other, in some way or another, F.B. Meyer said this, in some way or another, we will have to learn the difference between trusting the gift and trusting the giver. The gift may be good for a while, but the giver is the eternal love. And whenever in your life or mind some spring of earthly and outward resource has dried up, it has been that we might it, it has been that we might learn that our hope and help are in God who made heaven and earth. Amen. Don't keep looking at the natural for your answer. Keep your eyes on God who made the stream. Amen. Hallelujah. As the worship team comes back, there are reasons in life that cause all of us to have questions, doubts, and even fears at times. But these are the times when our faith becomes the strongest and our assurance moves from the temporal things that we can see with our eyes 
to the eternal things which we can only see by faith. Which is what we talked about last week. In these times, that our soul, it is in these times that our soul must learn to lean upon the one who never fails. These are seasons when the deep-seated resolve of our faith is established and we purpose within our heart never to be moved off of our confidence in God, His Word, His love, and the power of His grace towards us who believe. Come on, delay is not denial. You can still have hope in a hopeless situation because you know this thing is going to come to pass. Amen? I'm telling you, you, this is a prophetic word for some people in this building this morning. Think about it. Our testimony will be to declare his faithfulness as we stand our ground in faith and patience through the power and the comfort of the Holy Spirit working in us to receive the promise. And like Job, we will be able to declare that the Lord has blessed the latter end of our life more than the beginning. Praise the Lord. So hear me this morning, no matter what your circumstances may look like, no matter how great the need for or the insurmountable the problem may seem, God is faithful to his word and will always provide the grace we need for every situation. Because the giver is always greater than the gift, than any gift he may give. You know, yesterday at Khadijah's prayer summit on on, on uh, what she called Mount Hazel down there, the overlook over the, the Nimbus Dam there on Hazel Avenue. There was a young lady got up at the end from, from Iran and that, and uh, talking about how she got saved. And she began to read the scripture. She just had a challenge in her mind because she couldn't understand how man could become God when it came to Jesus. How can a man become God? And finally it was explained to her. Somebody came along and said, hey, you know what? You got it wrong. Man cannot become God, but God can become man. And God chose to become man that he might die for you and redeem you. And she said, I got saved right there on the spot. See, sometimes we just need that paradigm shift because we keep trying to figure out, how can I get to God? How can I make this happen? When God has already declared, he's come to us. He's the one who's moved on our behalf. Amen? And so it's just that shift of perspective and viewpoint. It just turns things around. Because the giver is always greater than any gift. So let your faith rest in the giver of life. And he will sustain you at all times. We use the access. Use the access you have to his grace. These last two scriptures, I want you to listen to them as I read them to you. Therefore, having been justified by faith... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him also we have access. Somebody say access. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Romans 5. And then Hebrews 6, 9 through 12 says this. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown towards his name. And that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. You know what? I just want to encourage you today. Find a way to be ministering to the saints. Find some way. Plug in. Get connected. Have your life be involved in ministering to the saints. Open your home for a life group. Let your kids. Sometimes people, how, how come my kids go astray when they get older? They quit. Well, did they ever see God in your home? Did they only hear about him at church? Or did you allow him to be on display in your home? So we're coming to home. Say, hey, we're going to gather together. We're going to do this, whatever it is. But opening our homes to God, finding a way to let him minister through you to the saint is such an amazing thing. God remembers everything you do. Listen to what it says. God's not unjust to forget your labor of love that you have shown to his name and ministered to the saints and do minister. And why? And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence. Listen to this. To the full assurance of what? Hope. 
until the end that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Amen. Come on, delay is not denial. You can hope against hopeless situations knowing that everything has come to pass. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Right now you have a choice. Right now you have a choice. And I, I don't know who this word. I just felt the Lord tell me to preach these three things. I'd have rather preach the whole message. I, I wanted to talk about all of our life groups, everything else, doing everything and all that stuff. And David, I don't know if they have it, but as we, if it's there to be able to put up. But I'm going to ask you to put up that clip and, and let our life group leaders roll in that. Well, we have that. You can join our team. That's a good one. Amen. Join our team, kickstart. But I think there's one there that just shows. Is, is that the whole clip that's going to roll like that? Perfect. Amen. So it's just a thing. You're going to see our life group leaders are going to come up, and then you're going to find out in, in the foyer out there, there's a card that tells you who all the leaders are and where all the homes are and hosts are and where you can be a part of that. But in dealing with ministry, in order for things to happen, how many are glad that Jesus left where he was to come to where you are? Jesus left where he was to come to where you are. And what happens in an altar call, this is why we ask you to come forward. There's something about leaving where you are to come to where He is. Because God has always ordained that He would meet people at an altar. Now this isn't an altar where we put animals on there and burn them. But this is a place where I bring my life as a living sacrifice to the Lord. Lord, I will move towards you. I will let go. You know, sometimes we just need to sacrifice our fears, our doubts, our unbelief. We need to bring them and place them on an altar. Things that are speaking against and contrary to God's word in our life. So today... You have a chance to respond to Jesus. His love, His grace, His forgiveness, His saving and healing power, His restoration, and to move towards Him and away from your circumstances. So as they begin to sing, I'm going to invite you. I'm just going to open these altars. We're going to pray together. But if, you, if that word is to you, and God had me speak this prophetic word to our church this morning, delay is not denial. If you've been battling that area, if you've been struggling and, and, and feeling like you're, you're just in a hopeless situation, this word has been for you. If you've been wondering and think, Lord, how long is this going to go? It's been hard for you to believe that this season will pass. Then this word has been for you because God cares enough about you that he would speak to me to get his grace to you. Amen. So as they